Hello, Rupert. Bonjour. Ah, uh, bon bonjour to you. How are you? Very well, thank you. You are addressing the crowd at uh, Audio Days here in Paris. And um, everyone, welcome Rupert Neve. Hey, Mr. Neve. Are we coming well, in? Well, thank you very much for that lovely, warm welcome. Um, and it's good to meet you, folks, uh, through the wonders of modern communication. So, um, bonjour, how do you say good evening in French? It's evening for you, isn't it? Yes. Bonsoir. 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 Okay. Um, I just remember a few words from my school day. But... Um, here we are in beautiful, sunny Texas. We have one or two clouds in the sky, so the light is coming and going a little bit through the windows. It's a lovely warm day in the autumn. And I gather the weather is not quite the same in Paris. Is that right? It's cool and rainy. Cool and rainy. Well, we need rain here in Texas, but um, uh, we're quite happy to have the sunshine. So, welcome to everybody, and uh, what can I do for you? <laughs> well, Rupert, I think the, the first order of business, is, as it were, is um, people would like to hear a, a little bit of a talk from you, just in general, on your thoughts regarding audio quality over the years, audio quality as you've observed it, um, goals, lofty aspirations, etc. Um, so if that's too generic an introduction, I can try again, but I don't think it will be much better. <laughs> well, you may have to stop me because uh, what you've given me is an agenda which um, will take a lifetime. <laughs> that's so, perfectly fine, Rupert. Um, I started off, of course, uh, with uh, a strong interest in audio playing um, gramophone records, which in those days, of course, were 78 RPM shellac records. And uh, my aim and object as a teenager was to try and improve the sound quality, both as to the circuits, the amplifier circuits, and the loudspeakers, which uh, we did not have all the facilities that we have today, but um, I was able to uh, put loudspeaker systems together which sounded good, at least I thought they did, and uh, was always after this quest for quality. And later on, when I had the opportunity of coming into the professional audio field, um, then that quest for quality continued. And also, of course, the question of reliability. Um, professional equipment, by which I mean mixing consoles, uh, microphone amplifiers, and uh, recording amplifiers that would drive the recording heads, were all, of course, tubes or valves in those days. And they tended to be somewhat unreliable. Uh, one of my quests was to make equipment not only sound good, but to make it very reliable. So my first uh, two or three uh, sound control consoles for London studios were actually tube valve consoles. Simple by today's standard, but uh, I think the one which comes to mind was one I designed and built for studio by the name of Recorded Sound Limited in Bryanston Street in London, and uh, Leo Polini was the engineer, and he specified a whole lot of features for this console, which really <laughs> I had never heard of. Um, he talked about uh, SFB. Well, SFB, I had to discover, was meant studio foldback. And then there was 
rev. What was rev? Reverberation. And I was totally unfamiliar in those days with the pro audio scene. But I realized that these were auxiliary circuits which the console had to feed, had to provide. So I built a 10 channel console which had two outputs and we could switch between the two outputs. Therefore, we could qualify it as a stereo console. Um, and the essence of this console was not only high quality and all my previous um, uh, attempts at quality now became into play, became valuable uh, because I could apply them in this professional field. And uh, I was able to not only make the, the uh, circuit sound good, but make them reliable so that uh, people would have little uh, fear of uh, a breakdown during a session. People have often asked me, why transformers? Well, those of you, and I believe you're all engineers, so you know what I'm talking about, tube circuits need high voltage to operate them, high supply voltages, um, typically somewhere around 300 volts. And so how do you get the audio signal out of your 300 volt tube circuit, how do you get that out of that into a line which drives, let's say, a recording cutting head or a monitor loudspeaker or whatever? Um, there's only one way. You need a transformer. Transformer with a primary which will accept the high voltage uh, signal and uh, supply voltage that's in your console and will transform it down to a line level. Now in those days, um, line level, which we accept today as being normal, um, it had to be defined. It came from the telephone industry and here I'm Again, I'm in danger of digressing, but you know, the telephone industry established a great deal of uh, what we do today in terms of those standards. Line level signals uh, were applied to telephone lines, hence the main line, and uh, as the telephone industry began to transmit signals not just between two local telephones, but from one town or one city to another, involving several miles of landline. So the need arose for uh, equalization of the line uh, and repeater amplifiers to overcome the losses of the line. Uh, typically, such a line would have a loss of something like 30 decibels per mile of, um, um, of length of line. And there were frequent uh, amplifiers had to be placed along the length of that line between two cities. And again, the telephone engineers had to design amplifiers which were highly reliable and were good enough quality to be able to overcome line losses. Several such amplifiers, or repeaters as they call them, were used between cities. So we owe a lot to the origins of the telephone industry. And I studied the transformers and the circuits that were used in the telephone industry. and. Um, built on that, on those basics, so that uh, uh, when we came to high quality sounds such as we know it, very much better than telephone quality, um, I was uh, using 
similar principles in the transformers and driving circuits. So let me just stop there and ask if you've got any questions. Have I uh, made myself clear or uh, is there something you'd like to know more about? No, I think that we're, we're doing quite well so far. I think we'd love you to just continue on the same path that, you're, uh, that we're walking down at the moment. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Merci. Sorry. <clears throat> well, um, so the day came when uh, I was asked by a studio owner, have you ever heard of transistors? And what are they? Will they ever be any good? Um, well, I really didn't know anything about transistors. In fact, very few people knew anything about transistors. And we're talking about the early 1960s. And um, um, several people asked that sort of question. And with some misgivings, I felt I had to start finding out about transistors. Uh, keep in mind that um, I had grown up with valves, tubes, and all these amplifiers, tube amplifiers that I've been talking to you about. I knew now quite a lot about <clears throat> high quality uh, tube circuits. And now I was being challenged with this new device, a transistor. What in the world did a transistor do? Well, I managed to get hold of some transistors and believe it or not, it was quite difficult in those early 1960s to get hold of transistors which were quality, uh, low noise, reliable, and so I managed to put circuits together which um, um, were the equivalent in performance to the valve tube amplifiers. In fact, I think I can show you the very first one. It's, it's, in, that, it's in that cupboard over there, Kristen. That, yeah, that's the one. <clears throat> so this, let's see, can, can you see that? Oh, yes, okay. Um, can you see that? 19... <laughs> that is the first line amplifier, and those little guys inside there are transistors mm -hmm. and a transformer. And that uh, circuit, well, I actually fired it up. Thank you, Tristan. I actually fired it up uh, a year or two ago, and it still works. <laughs> it is surprisingly good. <laughs> now, that was a line amplifier. A line amplifier, <clears throat> I would define as simply an amplifier which takes a line level signal and uh, of the order, if we take the standards of, that we use on the inputs and outputs of our consoles today, of let us say plus four dBU, dBm, and uh, will um, amplify that signal, giving it sufficient headroom to drive uh, whatever we're going to be driving in the control room. Uh, typically, of course, the output of such a line amplifier would go through a patch panel and would have destinations uh, such as monitor loudspeakers, um, in the old days, tape recorders, uh, or even disc recorders, if you go back far enough, which I do, <laughs> and uh, um, anything which needed uh, a reinforced line level signal. Um, the uh, essence of any console is the basic line amplifier. 
in any console today, there are a great number of line amplifiers. <clears throat> and their performance has to be absolutely pristine. Uh, you're often cascading amplifiers one after another, and the distortion and noise will be will tend to be cumulative. You have to make sure that you're not adding significantly to distortion or noise uh, on your input signal. Um, <clears throat> microphone amplifiers or preamplifiers are in a slightly different category because they will obviously have to take the signal output from a microphone which is at a very low level depending on the type of microphone we're talking about and will increase the level by giving it sufficient gain and again as you know the art or the science of doing that is that you have to uh, uh, be able to give to provide gain without significant distortion or adding noise um, <clears throat> Now, when the day came when I had put together some circuits which were all now transistor circuits uh, running off um, uh, running off 24 volt supply rails, as opposed to the typical tube voltage of 300 volts, you know I had. Uh, friends and clients in the industry, we said, well, if it's running off, <clears throat> off such a low voltage, how is it going to give us enough output? So again, we come to my friend, the transformer. The transformer would have to be designed to match between the transistor amplifier and the line or other level that you wanted to get to. In, at the output side of that transformer. Um, <clears throat> and I found that there were huge advantages in these transistors. For one thing, we didn't need any heaters, um, and therefore uh, the power demand was very much less than with tubes. Um, then we had, um, of course, the high voltage, which was not necessary. And the reason I went for 24 volts was because there were no bench power supplies in those days. And when I started to construct a power supply, it was very difficult to find parts, um, rectifiers, and regulators and stuff which we take for granted today just didn't exist in those days. So I abandoned my attempts to produce a low voltage power supply which was low noise and higher current and I used a pair of those lantern batteries, flash lamp batteries 12 volt batteries, two of those would give, a, give me the 24 volts. And so that was the first power supply on my bench. Um, a couple of batteries. And of course the battery in those days was not uh, an alkaline battery, it was the old McClanche battery um, which uh, starts to die the moment it's manufactured and if it's got a nominal 12 point something volts output when it's new, it starts to go down and down. And after a period of time, even if you don't draw very much current from it, the voltage has dropped. And so almost by default, I was finding that my amplifiers had to be able to run on not a full 24 volts, that had to be able to run on 22 or even 20 volts and give the same performance. So that was part of the design challenge. And then transistors had a bad reputation for reliability. 
Um, the circuits which were common in those days for amplifier circuits um, were very prone to an effect known as thermal runaway, where the transistor would start to get hot, it would draw more current, and therefore be even hotter, and finally it would get hotter and hotter and draw more and more current, and it would fit, and that's the end of your transistor, and that's the end of your signal. It's so simple these days, but it was not simple in those days. Uh, transistors were expensive, uh, control circuits were very difficult to apply, and um, the whole essence of design was low distortion, low noise, reliability, and as few semiconductors as you could get away with, because more semiconductors were more expense. Just as a side issue on the matter of expense, a microphone amplifier, which I developed, of course, needed a low noise transistor at the front end. And funnily enough, my memory tells me that this was a Texas Instrument 2G309. Now, I can remember that from 60 or more years ago. I can't remember what happened yesterday. So, <laughs> but that transistor supplied by Texas Instruments um, cost two pounds ten in English old money. Uh, what was that? Uh, oh, it was about uh, three dollars to the pound or something of that sort. It was a lot of money and they were very hard to get. Well, I managed to find a couple of these transistors and I liked them. They were low points and I called Texas Instruments and I said, well, I need to build these into a console. I have a contract for a 24 channel console and each channel is going to need one of these low noise transistors. So I need 24 and let's be safe, call it 25 2G309 transistors. And the Texas guy said, this is ridiculous. You realize what the price is and they're strictly rationed. We can only supply those transistors to important government and aircraft uh, industry uh, developments. Uh, who are you? Audio? Never heard of you. And pro audio? Not important. You cannot have this. And they rationed it to about six of these transistors. Well, I finally, I was an angry young man in those days. I'm now an angry old man. <laughs> <laughs> and I went over to uh, Bedford, where the uh, uh, headquarters in England of uh, Texas was, and I managed to speak to some high up person in the organization. And I said, I need these transistors. The industry needs the transistors. Where do you guys think you're going if you are going to limit the supply only to uh, government contracts and the aircraft industry and stuff which you think is important? The professional audio industry is much more important. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the argument eventually prevailed and I got my 25 transistors. There was no price reduction for quantity. <laughs> well, that was the kind of thing we were up against. And this is in the early to mid 1960s. So where was I? Transistors. Um, now there came a day also when um, uh, Philips Records, as they, 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 Philips Records had a studio in London and it was actually uh, called Philips Records. And um, Ron Godwin was the chief engineer. And he uh, asked me, he said, you 
call yourself a, a consultant. Uh, I would like to consult you. He said, we uh, need a mixing console. And um, Philips in Holland uh, can make this mixing console. Uh, it's a very high price, and it'll take two years to design and deliver. Um, what is your advice? As well, if you've got any other suppliers in mind, and he said, well, we have one or two other suppliers in mind. The prices range from, I think, about 1,500 pounds um, sterling to about 12,000 pounds sterling. I have no idea why there's such a big discrepancy. So as a consultant, could you have a look at these bids and um, tell me which one we should accept? So I looked at these bids. And of course, that was my golden opportunity. I said, these bids are absolute rubbish, garbage in America. And I will build you a console. And he said, can you do that? Well, of course. I said, I, you know, I, I'll take on anything. <laughs> and so uh, after all, I had that little line amplifier. Uh, and I knew I could build out on that amplifier. So he said, what would it cost? Well, there was no question of costing this scientifically or um, in the way an accountant would expect that to be costed. I just pulled the figure inspirationally out of the air, and I said, 4,300 pounds. He said, oh, good. He said, all we have to do now is that you deliver uh, one working module that we can listen to and evaluate, and then you've got your contract. And by the way, while that module was being designed, um, he called me and he said, can you build EQ, equalization, into that module? Uh, OK, what exactly do you, do you want? So. The point was that everything was mono in those days, and if you had a studio full of musicians and um, you made your recording, and later on as you listened to it, you didn't get the balance right, or in, in this case they were trying to record an orchestra with a guitar in, in, in the mix. And as you all know, it's quite difficult to balance um, such a disparate set of signals. The guitar is not a very powerful instrument. And then he said, is it possible to lift the guitar out of the mix? Because the alternative is that we have to call back all the artists into the studio, re-record, rebalance the whole thing at enormous expense. So if you can adjust the level of the guitar in the mix, it's going to be very valuable to us. Well, I designed an equalizer, which is the forerunner of the mid-band equalizers, which we use today. Uh, I was using uh, inductors, and I managed to make quite a high-Q circuit, which could be varied in frequency and in level. And there was a great deal of good fortune and heavenly inspiration. Uh, the um, guitar, as they played back their tape, they could actually home in on the guitar frequencies and adjust the level of the guitar in the mix. Well, I built for them in the first place a rack with, I think it was eight um, of these equalizers. And I delivered this rack of equipment one afternoon. And they spent the whole of the rest of the day not checking the equalization or any of these things which I've done and I was very proud of, but just uh, switching it 
in and out of circuit. They had recordings which were on tape, of course, and they um, um, ran these recordings and they um, switched the equalizers in and out, having set them flat so that they were listening AB between direct path without an equalizer or um, the path through the equalizer. And their object was to check the basic performance of the amplifiers, whether there was distortion and noise which was being added. Well, not only was there no perceptible noise or distortion, but some very puzzled engineers and producers kept on wanting to rerun this over and over again. Why? Because they said it actually sounds better coming through these equalizers than it does direct path. Well, that was one of the, that was the really real start, if you like, of the Neve <laughs> mystique. Um, so often since then, over the years, have we found that people are able to insert even a simple line amplifier into the uh, path, and it actually sounds better. Well, I've got a lot of theories as to why that should be, but that is the fact, and that's where this was first discovered, Philips Records in London, in about 19... 67 or 68 and that led to the uh, design and providing of a console which had equalization built into every channel first time that had been done equalization was not unknown but uh, mixing consoles in those early days tended to be a large horizontal table with cutouts in the woodwork and large rack-sized pieces of equipment um, let into the woodwork. And so you would have um, a microphone amplifier and you would have a mixing amplifier. Um, they called it a group amplifier. And then the output amplifier. And this was a very, very simple structure and very inflexible. Uh, if you wanted some sort of equalization, you could only insert an equalizer uh, at the group level, not at the channel level. And so typically, uh, if equalization was required, um, a, an equalizer such as a Pultec equalizer, which was becoming well known and was, of course, today is still very well known as a first class piece of equipment. But they would wheel it in on a trolley, plug it in, uh, sweep the dust off it, probably hadn't been used for some time, and they would insert it into the signal path. But hence the unreliability. There were cables and patch cords and all kinds of things which were interrupting the session. They found there was interruption in some of the circuits and there was noise and so on. Um, it was bad news if the producer wanted to insert some equalization into the pen. So to build equalization into each module uh, was good news and that really was the one of the fundamental basics of the original Neve consoles. So let me stop there and ask again, am I being understood? Are there any questions? Yes, hold on. I think there is a question. Yes. Hello, Rupert. Uh, first, can I say, um, God bless you, and thank you for your precious gift to humankind, the Neve sound. I think we all can agree with that. It, it is, it, it has, I think it has affected us all, whether we know it or not. 
Um, you actually answered my question. I was going to answer, qu ask you first if you think that um, the type of um, sound you were getting through this uh, module you described, that we like it because uh, we've heard it so much, but you answered the question because when these guys heard it, they had never heard it before, right? It was a new sound for them. So uh, now I, I modified my question to, can, do you think that your understanding or your skill to produce these circuits, it's because of your hearing, your ability to hear what sounds good, or your um, understanding of how the circuits work, which one do you think is more important? Uh, that's a very hard question to answer, <laughs> because um, I had to have an understanding of what defined good sound. And I had, as I had said earlier, done a lot of listening in my early days, when I was young, very young, listening to phonograph records and loudspeaker systems, which I built myself always striving for better quality sound. And I was able, uh, I, I lived in Argentina, my parents were missionaries, and uh, I was brought up in Argentina as a missionary kid. Um, I was able to go to places like the Teatro Colón in Buenos and listen to orchestras, to operas from time to time. Not as much as I would have liked, because these were costly things to go to. But I did have a point of reference in real sound. And anything that fell short of listening, uh, of the sound that you could get listening to a, a live orchestra or grouping of voices uh, was to me uh, a failure. Anything which fell short, I fell short, I had to try and improve on it. So I had this mental image, if you like, in my mind. And also, the thing which um, I'm now working on and continuing, I hope, to work on is the question of what sound does to the human mind. If the sound that you hear is sound that you like and appreciate, um, it generates a mood. If your mental state is one of relaxation and pleasure, um, listening to the real sound, and then you listen to reproduced sound, maybe of that same music, um, it falls short, does not give you that same mood, that same satisfaction, that same relaxation, that same pleasure. And this I started to develop a thought in it. Um, as a Christian, I believe that we are, uh, well, we're told in the Bible, we're designed in the image of God. He created me, he created you guys, and he created in his own image. He is the master creator. And in each one of us, there are elements of his creation. The sound that we listen to, um, we have access to listening to beautiful sounds, and of course, not so beautiful sounds. But we also have the ability to distinguish between the two. Um, it's part of our God-given gift to know the difference between something good coming from the perfectly good creator and something that is negative and does not come from him. So it's a very convoluted answer to your question, but um, I don't think you can separate out um, the circuit design from the concept of what you want that circuit to achieve. Does that help you at all? Yes, thank you. It was actually an excellent question because you, um, I think you related back to what you feel when, when you work with these circuits and I think that's a, a really good answer.
So not only not, not only hearing but also feeling and experiencing. And yes, thank you very much. My pleasure. You said feel, and that is feel, and that is the result of mood. When you listen to reproduced music, um, you are aware of um, either a degree of satisfaction in that the reproduced sound is close to the original or close to the image which you have built up in your mind as being the desirable, um, um, what should I say, image that you're trying to reproduce. Um, or you're failing to get there. And so you as engineers and producers and musicians will be in the same category. You'll be striving for perfection. We're never going to reach perfection, but we're getting to the point where we're beginning to understand many of the attributes which uh, go to create that feeling, that mood, if you like, of perfection. We're, we're, we're getting a little better than we were. And again, I use this word mood. You know, uh, I must look a little bit to the future. We talked a lot about the past. But the future is even more important and more exciting. Um, some years ago, 1977, Air Studios in London, George Martin and Jeff Emmerich, names which I'm sure are familiar to you. Um, my company uh, had been supplying George Martin Air Studios in Oxford Street, as they were then in London, with consoles for some time. and. Uh, these consoles had reached a stage of excellent quality, reliability, and uh, uh, general uh, satisfaction to the customer. Um, but I had sold in 1975, biggest mistake of my life. <laughs> but uh, the new owners were obviously not wanting to be to continue to be dependent upon the founder. They regarded me as being the old man, probably over the hill, had nothing left to offer. And they listened to other younger engineers, each one of whom had his own idea of what uh, direction technically the company should take. But setting that aside, the concepts of quality and reliability were being abandoned. Um, the, in those days before I sold the company, I used to make sure that I had a very strong quality control department and that nothing was left uncovered in the sense of quality of uh, circuits, uh, general performance. And the new people had not been so careful. One of the consoles that had been delivered quite recently um, was not giving satisfaction. Uh, Jeff Emmerich uh, was unhappy with what he heard. And I was called in. Um, to see if I could find out what it was that was making Jeff Emmerich unhappy. And that's hard work if you, any of you know Jeff Emmerich, a great guy, wonderful musician and producer in his own right. But um, he's kind of um, difficult to, <laughs> to talk to. He's kind of difficult to express himself. And we listened to the console in question. And Jeff listened to certain channels of this console, and I was watching him closely. 
and he was looking and feeling unhappy in mood situation. So I said, Jeff, what is it that makes you unhappy? And he said, well, it, we, were, we were setting up a circuit, you know, AP through the console or direct to the monitor. And he said, it sounds brighter through the console. Well, everybody had been expecting that it would sound less good through the console. But here it was sounding brighter. And so we measured. There were, we found that three channels in that console had had incorrect terminations on the output transformers. And there was a peak, 3 dB high, at 54 kilohertz. Now, Jeff Emmerich could perceive the effect of that. And people say, oh, he can't. Nobody can hear 54 kilohertz. No, you can't hear it. But the effect of it is there. Uh, you can perceive it, especially if you're a person like Jeff Emmerich, golden-eared person. Well, it was very easy to correct. We corrected the equalization on those transformers on the spot. And Jeff Emmerich relaxed. And again, I was watching his face. And the mood actually changed. It was quite amazing. So uh, I emphasize again this question of mood. You can perceive something that is not right. You may not know what isn't right. And uh, when eventually you find the answers, uh, depend upon your mood to indicate whether you found the answer or not. Now, that set me thinking, how is it that he could perceive the effect of something taking place at 54 kilohertz? I did quite a lot of work on this, and I found that others, too, had been working on it. The Japanese Institute of Mass Media Education under Professor Uhashi had been finding that uh, if frequencies above 20 kilohertz are cut off by means of, let's say, a filter, the, there are electric brain waves which come from the brain and can be measured, um, which uh, produce electric brain waves uh, equal to those associated with dissatisfaction, frustration, and even anger. Now, this is the basis of mood. So the compact disc with which we're all familiar does, of course, not reproduce anything significant except garbage above 20 kilohertz. <laughs> and so when you listen to a compact disc, you either have to bear in mind that it does have limitations and that you're not listening for the satisfaction of beautiful music reproduced through a compact disc, but you're listening to something else. Um, this can be measured. Uh, Professor Uhashi uh, invited me into his studio on a visit to Japan. And he gave me uh, a box with switches on it. And he had a number of filters uh, built into that box. He had um, a um, direct digital system as one stream. Um, he had a tape recorder, which had been equalized up to about 40 kilohertz. Um, this was just a, a standard studio tape recorder, um, but very carefully equalized. And he had various other uh, ways of overcoming the 20 kilohertz barrier. And he invited me to listen to these various different uh, paths of signal, signal paths, um, and to <laughs> tell him which was the one which was the one which was pristine and was satisfactory. Well, as I sat in this little listening booth, looked through the window and saw 
all these eager and smiling Japanese faces on the other side of the glass, I realized that it wasn't the equipment that was being tested, it was me that was being tested. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, again, I found that there was one particular combination which sounded to me to be sort of more relaxing. I mean, at that stage, I didn't really understand about mood. But it sounded to me uh, a sort of happier situation to listen to. So finally, I put the box down and I said, well, this is it. This is the part I like. And they were all uh, applauding because by great good fortune, by great inspiration from the Lord, if you like, I had found the very path which was open, and it was a path which was open right up to 100 kilohertz. Um, now, you don't have to have a path open to 100 kilohertz, but you do have to have a path which is capable of reproducing the frequencies of the instruments that you are recording and reproducing. Um, maybe 40 kilohertz, maybe 50 kilohertz or above. Not only must that path be capable of reproducing these frequencies, and every uh, musical instrument, or almost every musical instrument, does in fact have natural harmonics which go way above 20 kilohertz, as I'm sure you know. Um, <clears throat> You have to be able to reproduce these, and you have to also make sure that the path is free of distortion. You must not have any distortion or noise artifacts in that path. Um, the problem with uh, the uh, compact disc is not only does it cut off at somewhere in the region of 20 kilohertz, but it produces a lot of quantizing noise, which is, uh, as it were, swept out into the frequencies and above 20 kilohertz. So that, which you're still aware of, you still are able to perceive, is polluted. So we must be totally free of distortion, we must be totally free of noise and other garbage, right up to the highest possible frequencies. And if you can do that, you have a path which is satisfactory and produces in you uh, the sort of mood that you would uh, achieve if you were listening to the actual live music, not reproduced music. Um, and again, I could ramble on a great deal, but I'm sure we're running out of time, um, about uh, crossover distortion in amplifiers which produce uh, little switching clicks which go way above 20 kilohertz and all that kind of thing which creep into the path. So what we've achieved in our new equipment, the 5088 mixer and all the modules that go with it um, is a total path right up to the very highest frequencies. Um, it's achieved by using entirely Class A amplification throughout with very simple um, home-built op-amps and low noise, no crossover distortion and um, the whole of the system, if you measure it, you'll find that what I'm saying is not just salesman's talk but it's true. And uh, uh, so that is the reason now for the way in which you will hear and be hopefully be satisfied and pleased with the signal that you hear through um, the Neve equipment of today. We're not finished yet. <laughs> we have a number of uh, new ideas which uh, uh, one of them is how do you actually record these signals. So. Um, we are working on the people who go in for direct, uh, direct.
bit of BSD recording, <laughs> which gives us very high sampling thickness and so on. So I'm sorry, I'm tending to ramble. But no, let's no, stop that's for fine. Any and, and actually, Rupert, would you mind repeating the last two sentences? Because the, the computer just cut out on us, and I think we missed it. <laughs> you were saying what, what you were about to be recording or about to be working on was a recording device that, and then it was garbled. <laughs> we're all quite intrigued at this point. Well, we do need a recording device which is capable of receiving and storing uh, all these wonderful signals that come from a 5088 and all the modules that go with it. Um, and I'm not a digital designer, but uh, the way in which I think it can be done, and I know that it can be done, is to use a direct stream digital system with it. Um, divide up into the normal PCM system. Um, it's a, if you like, it's a single bit, and it's got a resolution frequency of 4.8 megahertz or higher. So there is virtually no restriction on frequency response, and there is no um, garbage of quantizing noise in that panel. Now, that can be done. To record, how do you reproduce that? Um, Sony some while ago brought out the SACD system, which is precisely that, a direct stream digital. Um, and you need a special Sony player to play with the discs on. Um, and the result is excellent. The uh, only limitation is that the signal that goes onto that disc uh, is still limited if you've got a poor microphone amplifier or a poor quality mixing console uh, somewhere in the path. Uh, those attributes apply. But if you use a really first class mic pre and mixing console um, and you use the Sony system, or you can use direct stream digital, uh, which there are a, a number of units now available to do this, you can record um, to those standards. But reproducing them is more difficult. How in the world do you deliver if it's not on the disk? And I don't think we've found a way yet of, uh, apart from Sony, uh, who have covered it with patents, you're knee deep in patents, so don't try and go there. But um, um, nevertheless, the system is, is right. And so, for instance, I've got a little machine here, and I'm not advertising, but here is a Korg uh, handheld recorder, which is capable of recording um, these very high frequencies and several versions of the direct stream digital. Um, but and taking it from that little recorder, how do I reproduce that in terms that anybody can go out to the store and buy? Uh, so I believe that the future is the essential elimination of the compact disc. And what will happen is there are a number of people now uh, to whom you can go online and download these high-grade um, musical files, and um, you can now buy um, a little dongle which you plug into your USB port on the computer, and it will convert these signals to audio at very high quality. I believe that's an indication of the way things are starting to move. Does that help? Does that answer, <laughs> give you a long answer to the question? I believe the consensus is yes. Why? Why? As they say here. Um, are, there, are there other questions from the audience? Anyone in particular? I, I think the general idea was that um, he was saying that the music industry, as far as the creation of content, the creation of music has come a very long way 
and people are using their desktop computers. They're using digital audio workstations at home and studios. And um, he's aware that you've collaborated on a handful of plugins that are out there for these systems. And how do you feel about the, that direction that the industry is going and the usage of these plugins and how they compare? Is that accurate? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes, there are some very good plugins. The early plugins were not so good, and uh, people rightly were highly suspicious. But today, for instance, we've been working with Yamaha um, over a period of several years. Uh, they have created a number of plugins where I can listen to the plugin and listen to the actual hardware module on an A-B comparison, and I can't hear any difference. Uh, they have done an exceptionally good job. So if you're careful in your selection of the plugin and who designed it, and you have confidence um, in that, then um, I don't have any problem with, with plugins. I don't think they'll ever be absolutely as good as the hardware. But there's so many advantages, aren't there, with a plugin that uh, the cost is one thing and you can repeat your plugin across a number of channels, whereas the hardware to do that would be very expensive. Does that help at all? And uh, we have another over here. I have, a real sim um, I have a simple question. Which of your design are you the most proud of? <laughs> Well, I've referred already to the major console, um, the 5088. Um, that I started work on about 15 years ago. And uh, uh, this evolved, really. Um, let me tell you for time for a couple of minutes here, that I was consultant to AMEC until about 1998 uh, or 99, and uh, or even a bit later than that, and uh, designed uh, a major console for them, and uh, the 1998. And after that, I designed a series of equalizer modules, which we called the Pure Path series. That Pure Path series um, had, was called Pure Path because there was distortion so low that it was virtually unmeasurable. Uh, the noise was lower than anything that I had achieved before. And uh, the frequency range was quite exceptional. And when we built these circuits into an equalizer, on the bench, it measured absolutely wonderful. I was very pleased with the measurements. But strangely enough, it did not sound as good as the predecessors. It did not sound as good as my older consoles, um, which had known quantities of distortion and noise. Um, well, you know, when you've worked on something for three or four years, and the end result is that it's not as good as you expected. Um, what do you do about it? Well, in my case, I had to sit get down on my knees and pray about it, because I really didn't know the answer. But bit by bit, it came to me that this absolutely pristine performance was not, and. There were things about the design which, in which it failed. I won't go into all the inner details, but the excellence of a specification is not actual proof of the excellence of the sound which comes through it. So I started work again, and um, this led to the design of the 5088. I eliminated 
the remaining faults of the pure power system. And um, we had to completely eliminate all integrated circuits from the signal of integrated circuits. Again, that's a long story. I won't bore you with the details. But almost by definition, an integrated circuit produces um, crossover distortion. Small amounts, maybe, but it does produce some. So the way in which we overcame this was to produce, to design our own integrated circuit, if you like, our own operational amplifier. Now, that um, is expensive, and that is uh, uh, that was met with quite a lot of resistance on the part of my colleagues. How will anybody ever be able to afford that? Well, by a lot of diligence and hard work and so on, um, the fact of the matter is that if you look at a 5088 console and compare its features with features of some other console that is similar, it is not expensive. It stands on a par with others from the cost standpoint. But the performance is has eliminated all the known things that uh, we think contribute negatively to performance. So I'm in danger of doing a sales pitch here, but that really is the um, uh, piece of equipment which I'm, and of course, the team that helped me to do this. I started to say, hey, we did this, we did that, because uh, no man is an island, no man can do everything on his own. In the very early days, I had to do it myself. Uh, in later days, of course, um, I have had colleagues, and we have today a team of uh, six wonderful designers who work with me and alongside me and are able to fill in those things which now as my age increases and I get slower and uh, um, uh, less quick off the mark as it were, um, they fill it in for me and so a lot of the performance and the excellence of the present range of equipment is due to them, not entirely due to me. So that is a double pride, if you like, pride in the people that work with me and pride in the, in the result. Thank you. All right. Um, well, I think there, there were actually a few questions that were submitted um, prior to us being here, and I'm going to go through just a couple of those. Um, is there anything that you have not yet done that you would like to do? This is a general question, but feel free to answer in whatever way you'd choose. Well, I would like to live for another 80 years. <laughs> <laughs> because during that time, hopefully, I would be able to build on the experience of the first 80 years. And uh, actually, I'm 87 now. So, uh, I need more time to do the many things that are in my mind. But basically, I want to be able to um, not only achieve affordable uh, circuits and equipment, which embodies these various principles that I've been talking about, but to be able to uh, put them into the the public. Uh, instead of compact discs, maybe some um, little dongle which you can use with your computer and uh, to make it affordable, to make it as affordable as a compact disc. Um, we're a long way from actually getting there yet. And it is on the way, it is being done, not entirely by me, but by people who have picked up this whole concept of um, extremely wide frequency response, extremely low distortion, and um, 
uh, all these things I've been talking about, there's, we're into, as it were, diminishing returns so that there's no great breakthrough. Great art just suddenly going to burst upon uh, you gentlemen in your design concepts. But little by little, uh, we'll make progress together, I hope. So um, I need time to achieve that. This this last question comes um, somewhat on the heels of that one, which is, if you had some pieces of advice to give to the coming generations of audio engineers, of music appreciators, and people in general, what would you say that might be? I would say, firstly, listen to actual orchestras, music, individual voices, and combined voices. Um, listen to the real thing and form an image, memorize in your mind that image so that when you come to reproduce those sounds, you've got a point of reference that you can turn to. Um, and there are some amazing pieces of equipment available now where you can actually measure the brain waves that come from your head when you are listening to certain types of um, um, music that create mood and so actually produce um, electric brain waves. Um, and if you can afford it, they're not very expensive. There's a thing that I have here, which is the mind wave. And you can strap a piece of equipment to your head and look at the result on the computer. And you won't be able to see the detail here, but this shows you the different waveforms that come from your brain wave when you are listening either to uh, a sound which gives you pleasure and relaxation or goes the opposite way and indicates something wrong, some deficiency in the audio path. Uh, so you can actually measure this. And this sort of equipment is educational stuff. It's uh, a few hundred dollars. It's not thousands. So if you can access something of that sort, that will help you to define whether or not um, the, what you're listening to is giving you those relaxed brain waves or those angry and fast brain waves. So listen, listen, listen. And if you can't actually measure, then go on listening and listen with, with friends and discuss what you're listening to. And that way you'll be able to um, achieve circuitry and equipment which the next generation will be proud of. Well, um, if there are no further questions, anyone? All right. Well, I think we're, we're all set on this end. If there's anything else in particular that you'd like to say, Rupert, you're welcome. Well, thank you very much for listening to me. Um, it's been a bit of a but then, you know, if you ask somebody who is an enthusiast, especially an elderly enthusiast, uh, to talk about his pet subject, uh, that's what you get. Thank you very much. For we your asked patience. for it, so it's okay. <laughs> and uh, thank you, um, especially as I'm afraid I don't speak enough French to make myself understood. But thank you very much indeed. And God bless you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Thank you.